Uh, thanks very much to Damien for coming up here today. He's going to be talking about front end workflow. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, Simon. Um, so let's start uh, by talking about front end JS workflows. I'm Damien. I'm a French creative developer. Uh, so I like to think I'm a rock star, but let's talk about that later. Um, I like to work on WebGL, Canvas, so Web Audio, whatever that might be fun uh, in front end. Um, during this talk, we're going to ask ourselves a lot of questions and try to answer them. So, press yourselves. Um, this is going to be divided in three parts. First, um, what are the common tools of our current workflow? The second time, we're going to see uh, what is Gulp and what is new in the upcoming version, Gulp 4. And finally, uh, we're mm -hmm. going to ask ourselves our task runner, task runner still relevant and what to expect. Uh, in 2016. So uh, let's start with this first part. What are the common components in our current workflow? Um, just start by saying that I'm going to focus only on the development side, not the deployment, testing, other sides of the workflow. And I'm going to divide that into four components, uh, which are package manager first. Um, the module system, which is related to the third component, the module loader, and uh, the task runner. Uh, those are tools that, as front-end developer, we're using on a current, on a daily basis. But I think it's good sometimes to just hit the pause button and remember what uh, are those tools. So let's start with our first component, uh, the package manager. The main function of package manager is to handle dependencies. But what is a package? Um, could be defined as a set of files that are bundled together and can be installed and removed as a group. Um, that being said, uh, what is the purpose of the package manager? Uh, it should handle the centralization, meaning that all of your package should be lying in one place. And it should facilitate the installation and installation of those packages. And also, um, uh, under the upgrade of these packages through versioning, so we're giving a version to each package, uh, and that facilitates the dependency of the package, package dependent from other packages. All right. Uh, in the GS world, we got two main competitors, which are Power, tends to be the package manager for the web, and we got uh, NPM, which is uh, claims to be the package manager for JavaScript and a lot of stuff. But uh, I also want to introduce GSPM, the JavaScript package manager. Some of you may know it. Uh, so let's start with. Bauer. Um, I'm going to do some examples to make this easier. Uh, let, let's assume you want to start a project. Uh, you're using Bauer. You got this um, need of a JavaScript function, so you're probably going to go for this library called underscore. And if you want to install it into the project, you can run a terminal command, Bauer install underscore, if you want to choose a specific version, so we talk about versioning of the package manager, here is the version 1.4.3, why not? And then later on, at some point, uh, you may want to use a JavaScript framework to uh, make better code and more organized code. So you may want to use Backbone, which rely on underscore and dependency. And you try to run this command in your project, Bauer install backbone. But then uh, Bauer doesn't like that. He asks you, uh, it says enable to find a suitable version for underscore, please choose one. Why? Uh, because Bauer is based on the assumption that there can only be one version of a library in the browser at the same time. 
So you have to choose. The choice of dependency is left to the user. Here we're gonna, probably going to go for the second one, which is the most recent, uh, because that one uh, requires a version with uh, 1.7. And we all set up now. We got a Power Components folder, which contains uh, our three dependencies for our project, like one and so on. That's basically what Power does, getting you dependency from a single command line. But the thing is, uh, to use Power, you have to install it on your own machine. And uh, you do that using NPM. So you really need Power on top of NPM. Let's compare this example with uh, the same uh, workflow uh, with NPM. Uh, looks pretty much the same. We run the command NPM install. We select the version. And then when we want to install Backbone, we run NPM install Backbone. And we got a non use folder, which is created in the project. And uh, there's no problem here, because NPM uh, doesn't make the same assumption as Power, and there's nothing wrong with having two different versions of underscore in your project. That's one of the main differences between those two. Um, <clears throat> but if at some point you decide that you don't want this uh, 1.0.3 version, you can uninstall it, or you can uninstall underscore. And if you want, that's something new in the NPM pre version. Um, before that, we were having this listed folder. Uh, now, if you run the command NPM preview, you can put this module at the root in the same way as Power does. Uh, it was a problem with uh, Windows because uh, I think Windows doesn't handle well a long, long, very long path. So that was something that was happening on Windows. Uh, I invite you to read uh, those two articles. I'm going to give you the slide after the, the presentation, uh, which will explain a bit more on how we can set up uh, just a front end uh, thanks to NPM. And those articles also tackle those assumptions that NPM is only for CommonJS and for server side development. That's not true. You can use it for anything that is front end related. So, you could easily push, uh, publish uh, a CSS grid system on NPM that would be completely fine. But uh, the more interesting package manager, I think, for you is uh, GSPM, the JavaScript package manager, which is basically two things, system.js and a registry. It looks the same, always. Uh, common GSPM install. Uh, but this is more a, man a manager of package manager in a way that it's using not its own central database, but it's using others. So if you want to install a package which is published on NPM, you prefix your command with NPM. The same goes for the web. Uh, but because this is a bit verbose, uh, there's a registry file which maps uh, um, for instance, React to NPM React. So if you run yes, you can start React. Uh, it's going to map and find JSPM on NPM. That's a lot of NPM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and that's the structure you got. You got uh, it works with a package JSON, a config file, and a JSPM packages folder where all of your dependencies go. There were also um, other attempts at building uh, package managers, specifically for JavaScript. Uh, you may want to try those, but uh, in my opinion, they're only trying to solve one specific problem the others encounter with Power or NGM. So it may be a waste of time if you, but you, you can have a look. Um, so that's it for our first component of our workflow, the package manager, which handles the dependencies. Uh, let's go to our second component, uh, the module system, uh, which defines a way of writing modular code. You, as developer, want to write modular code, meaning you want to separate the component of your application 
into small modules that does uh, one thing well. And uh, yeah, we want to do modular code. Uh, why? Because uh, JavaScript doesn't have any built-in support for modules like other uh, languages like Java or anything. You can there's a module system, not in JavaScript. Uh, but that's going to change thanks to ES6, the uh, newest version of JavaScript, which is coming. And we're gonna compare uh, compare four different ways of doing modular code inside the browser. Those are uh, using the normal JavaScript, let's say, uh, MD Common JS, and uh, the newest version of JavaScript ES6. So let's take an example uh, of a music player. Um, <clears throat> if that's what we were doing five years ago using JavaScript, defining a simple variable, music player module, and assigning it to a function, a closure function, which has a, a property to interact and um, which returns two methods, play and get method. That's how simple our modi uh, music player module is, which goes to any uh, With that, how do you use that specific module, which is in a music player JS file in a, in a project? You import it uh, as follows in your HTML, you put in a script tag, and you get in the source, and then and then you can use it as follows well, play and get method. The problem with that is, um, is that the music player module is global, so it's available everywhere in your application, and you don't want, you don't want that. You want privacy of modules. You want this logic of private public modules, and you want to encapsulate your code into something that is uh, not available to the whole window object of JavaScript. That's it for the first uh, element. Um, <coughs> let's have a look at AMD, which stands for Asynchronous Module Definition. Uh, it's basically uh, an API that defines modules, um, the way and a way of handling dependencies between those modules, and uh, uh, a way of loading them asynchronously. So how does it look? We got this defined function which takes three elements. The first argument you define the name of the new module. The second one uh, is the dependency, so your module is dependent, dependent on an Ajax module to get, for instance, uh, an MP3 file. And then you define a factory function, which looks pretty much the same as the one before. And to use that, uh, um, you require it as a dependency in the uh, project. Uh, the syntax uh, is slightly more complicated, um, but it's fine. It's a good start at modules in JavaScript. Its main use is the browser, uh, compared to CommonJS, which is uh, which main use is uh, server side. But <coughs> CommonJS, it's Really, it's the same. It defines an API for modules. It defines a way to handle dependencies between modules. But instead of having a asynchronicity, we got a synchronous design here. Um, <coughs> so here it's a bit different. You require, thanks to the require keyword, and you got these objects that export your method from this music project file. And if you want to use it, you require it somewhere else in another module, uh, and then it's a little bit of an interesting transpose the track ID. What's that? The track ID. Yeah. What is that? It's just a random. Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, okay. it has this one in it, not this one. No, no. Okay. Not one of my songs. <laughs> Uh, and the, the last, uh, last one is ES6, so the next version, or the present version of JavaScript, which um, is kind of similar to the previous one, CommonJS, in a way that we got this, uh, we put our import into the file, 
Here we're using keyboard import from Magum. And another keyboard export here. Well, this file is called those two networks. Still the same. And how do you use it? Uh, you import it, so you require it that way. You get in your true exported uh, function here uh, from this module, and you can use them. Uh, you could have just imports the play function if you just needed the play function. Uh, and that's the best of the two previous uh, syntax by uh, <coughs> allowing synchronous and asynchronous loading. So that's it for our second component, uh, which is uh, bound to this one, the module loader, the module bundler, which function is to ship uh, the modules to the browser. Because your browser, Chrome Firefox, is not able to understand the ID or the common JS syntax, neither the ES6 syntax yet, because the specification is uh, still in development, it's probably going to be implemented this year in Chrome. Um, but the browser can't read it, so we need to find a way to make it readable to the browser. Um, another, um, wh why do you need a module loader? Because uh, or module bundler, um, because uh, you need to bundle all your modules into a single file. Why is that? Because the web relies on some a protocol called HTTP, and on its version 1.1, 1 .1, uh, you couldn't make a lot of requests at the same time, at least it could do it, but it wasn't performance. So that's why we used to bundle all of our modules inside one single file, so it's more efficient to just request one file than 20. But this is, uh, again, something that is changing with uh, HTTP2, uh, which allows simultaneous connection through something called multiplexing. You can check. And so just saying that we like to believe that JavaScript is an interpreting language, meaning that we put all of our files in the browser and it's reading it on the fly. But with our current workflow, it's more of a compiled or transpiled language because we have to have sources, source files, and we need to compile them before, or to transpile them before uh, shipping them to the browser. All right. Uh, let's compare uh, different model bundlers for JavaScript, model loader. Require.js, browser file, webpack, JSPM, and voila. Uh, there's a bullet point comparison link if you want to have a better overview of each features of each uh, module vendor. But let's uh, start uh, with Require.js. Um, <clears throat> it works well the, with the AMD syntax. And the main feature of it uh, for me is that you don't need this bundle step, uh, at least in development. You can just uh, uh, get um, the entry point of your application, and require is um, able to determine it, which module you should load, uh, which module is dependent on which module, uh, etc. So you don't have to go through that step of bundling your files. Uh, then we got Browserify, which is really tightly bound to the Node.js ecosystem, to NPM and all the common JS syntax uh, stuff. Um, one of the best features of Browserify is uh, this thing called Transform. Uh, so uh, how does it work? Let's say you've written all of your module by choosing the common JS syntax, and then you have to uh, use one module, which is uh, written in AMD, instead of rewriting all of the module to common JS, you're using this transform, which is just taking this file and make it readable by common JS uh, before bundling. So that's one use case, but many other transforms available. Can have a look. Um, <coughs> this next one, Webpack. Um, it works well with common JS and AMD. It's not as bound to Node.js as uh, Browserify. And <coughs> it 
to get this feature called plugins, which is kind of the same as the transforms, and this it provides the same option. Uh, the difference is that it puts much, much more stuff into its core. So that's an option, not bad option. And <coughs> so remember, we talked about GSPM, the JavaScript Package Manager, and one of its components was SystemJS. Uh, and what is it? It's, it's a module bundler, a module loader, exactly, uh, which understands every syntax in JavaScript possible. Uh, this is compliant with the S6 module specification. So this is basically what's going to be the future of JavaScript uh, in module loading. And that's the best feature of JS. So you don't need to bundle and find the dependencies. And you got plugins as well. Uh, and the last one, or up yet another module bundler, but that's not my point here. Uh, I just want to talk to you guys about <coughs> this feature called Live Code Inclusion, or Tree Chicken, uh, for example. So let's say you got a new JS file which has two objects in it, and you export those two objects. In the second file, you're importing those two objects, but you can see that we're only using foo and not bar. Uh, so why should bar be present in your final bundle if you're not using it? That's what tree shaking does. It removes you know, the code like that, and in our final file bundle, there's no reference to bar which is not used. So that's one good use case for uh, for instance, if we're using underscore, which ships with hundreds of function, JavaScript functions to help us do stuff with data, um, <coughs> we always end up using like 5% of underscore, and that leaves me with 95% uh, of code that is not necessary in my final bundle, so why should I keep it? That's one of the good features that Rollup ships with. And my point here uh, is that I don't think that Rollup as a model bundler will survive, but this feature is going to be uh, introduced, uh, most notably, into GSPM. Uh, so we here at our fourth component of this workflow. Bear with me. Uh, this is the task runner. Uh, I will only say that this is for automating, uh, make you, making you more productive, and we're going to talk about that in more details in the second part. There is grunt, there is gulp, and other attempts. But let's take a quick break uh, of that code and just have a look at one of the projects I worked on at Unit 9, which is called Flavorize Me. Um, Um, so this brand of ice cream penalty, uh, Italian, they all Italian, uh, is uh, asked, uh, asked us to be part of their campaign. Uh, they wanted their user uh, to create a specific flavor of ice cream. So we came up with this idea of uh, getting uh, the user's social data uh, from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and through an algorithm, determine uh, what flavors you could get. So let's demo it. Um, I'm going to connect my Twitter account. Right. So now it's gonna, the algorithm is going to check all of my tweets and give me a good flavor as and of a screen of fully, so we got these two components, uh, the graph, which apparently, I don't know, is how it is. So <coughs> that's it, and we got this WebGL blob, which is moving so as long as the, uh, the analyze is done. So my, my flavor is Kiwi, why not mine? <coughs> why not? <laughs> and, <coughs> And why? It's because I'm very, very, very sweet. I got 68% <laughs> of sweet. I'm a bit bitter and spicy, but 
whatever. So that's uh, one of the projects we use um, <coughs> WebGL to uh, 3GS, which is a 3D graphic library to uh, do this lovely thing. Um, <coughs> yeah, that was a really fun project. And if I get back to that slide, uh, this is basically the structure we use. Uh, we got a backend folder, we got a package JSON. So at some point in the project, I probably run npm install uh, 3GS, the 3D library. And that I did it to the package JSON. So when another developer got the project <coughs> on his machine, he ran uh, npm install and uh, everything worked fine. He could use the project. And we got although those two folders, project and website, project which is the source folder with other folders, a copy script, SAS for CSS preprocessing, which uh, are the source of the project, and those sources are being compiled into the website folder. Thanks uh, to Gelp and also SAS, that's what we are going to talk about. But first, uh, let's run a quick poll. Uh, who in the audience is a front-end developer? Quite by the front-end developer. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right. Uh, who's using Gulp as a task runner? Cool. Who's using Grunt? All right. Who's using another task runner? Like you guys. Uh, who's using nothing at all? No task runner. All right, that's, that's pretty good. Good job, Manchester. Um, that's the overall statistic for the previous year. 44% uh, were using God, 28 grants, over 9% and 20 no, no task runner at all. Um, <coughs> so, so we ended. And let's have a look at what is Gulp. We probably know a lot of the stuff, but I'm just going to give you them. And what are the changes in Gulp for the next version, which hopefully will ship soon? So, what is Gulp? Um, it's three things: it's streams, uh, JavaScript API, Node.js <coughs> API, and a common library interface tool. Uh, the main goal is to automate the tasks. So, the baseline of Gulp is the streaming build system. Uh, the best way I can find to explain it is by comparing it to Grunt. Uh, so Grunt, how does Grunt work? When you're running a Grunt command, uh, it takes sources files, uh, apply a, something, a transformation on it, and then uh, read, uh, write this file into a temporary folder. And if there is another task chain, it's, it's going to do that uh, uh, reading, uh, transforming the file and writing it uh, a lot of time. So this read and write process is not very efficient. Uh, so that's why Gulp came up with streams, uh, which only takes uh, the source files, transform that into a buffer, uh, a stream, basically a raw data, and pipe transformation one after the other without having those steps of writing the files, the temporary files in the file. So that's a bit more efficient on that point. Uh, so, as I said, it's just an API. So, how does it work? Um, you want to get your source files uh, like that. Gulp, uh, the SLC. And the argument you're passing is Glob. Uh, Glob is defined as a pattern that allows us to select or ex exclude a bunch of files. Uh, here, for instance, uh, we're selecting all our file, uh, all our images that are in the images folder, and thanks to this explanation mark here, uh, we're excluding the sprite uh, folder from the images folder. So this uh, just gets uh, all of the sprites and return a stream, uh, which is saying we can pipe. And let's say let's say you've exported a lot of images from Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop uh, export sucks. There's a lot of stuff that you don't want in it. So you're using a plugin to minify your images to make it uh, to make them more 
a performance uh, demo uploading on the browser. And how do you do that? You use this I function and you put the plugin image in it. And it's gonna transform the pipe uh, from the screen in them. And then you pipe a gulp destination. So you got just a sys pipe, you inside them, and you put them in a destination for It's as simple as that. And in three lines, you, you just do uh, what that you take a lot of time by going to the PNG website, uh, uh, uploading your files and getting them back, putting them in the destination folder. That's just automation. Um, but the API is uh, under task and watch because we have the content of a task, but we need to find a way to call it in some way. So we're using build task uh, here with two arguments, the name of the task, which is, and the content uh, function. Uh, this exposes the images uh, task to the program API so that we can uh, then call it as a dependency. So, for instance, if you want to serve files, uh, you need first to uh, run those three tasks, uh, images, take a break and smile, and only when those three tasks are done, you can run the function that then is it. But it uh, also exports uh, that the watch, uh, watch function, basically it's just, uh, you don't want to run your command each time you get new images, so you're just running something that watch changes in your images folder, and each time you're adding a file to the images folder, it's going to run the images task and put them in the destination folder. But more importantly, it exposes the, this image task to the command line interface so that you can run your images and go through that. <coughs> yeah, that's as simple as that. Got the name of the task, the name of another task. Easy. Um, but a few just have changed in the motion for of uh, That's how you install it now. Uh, there were some API changes and a new task system. Uh, I put together an example on GitHub, uh, which is, uh, I think, a good start to get a grasp of what it's good for. And <clears throat> uh, it's far from being perfect, but uh, it's a good introduction. If we go back to our first part, it's using as package manager uh, NPM. Uh, the module syntax is uh, ES6, but you can use others. The module system is Browserify, and the build system, obviously, is GitHub. So let's have a look at those new changes. We still got the GitHub source destination watch and task uh, method, but uh, this one has a new syntax. <coughs> Forget about the three argument syntax, this doesn't exist anymore. And get four, and we have got uh, those two new methods, parallel and series. Uh, what do they do? Uh, before the four, that's how you run. Uh, that's how you handle dependencies. Uh, if you want to run serve and watch through um, at the same time, and that, uh, after the markup style split images are done, you have to do it like that using plugin. A Node.js module uh, for the run sequence, uh, where you put uh, all the tasks that you want to do in parallel are put inside arrays here, and they are separate. If you want to do them in series, you separate them by comma. So here we got two series and uh, four and two parallel. In Google code, that's how you write it. Uh, for me, it looks uh, much easier to understand. We run those two lines in series and uh, use those parallel and those in parallel. Uh, that's a good way of combining all of those tasks. So, the new task system. Uh, remember, this is uh, what we got in GUT 3, the 3 and syntax, with the name, the dependencies, uh, the task dependencies, and the actual content. In GULP4, uh, we use uh, two arguments, and that's 
Um, so let's say for instance we got to near 6, um, 5, uh, which exports 3 third pass or could be other pass. Optimize images, generate spy sheets, generate spy accounts. And you will import them in your uh, GUP file. And how do you use that now? How do you use GUP, GUP task? Uh, you click on the name and then you run uh, GUP parallel to all this task. So now GUP task is only used for something that you want to call from the terminal and not something that you want to call as a dependency. Because uh, as you can see here, those are just plain functions. Those are not uh, tasks, get tasks, and there are this syntax that works with only one argument, one function. <coughs> if you're using a name function, that's enough for exposing uh, exposing to the key. You can run get clean, which uh, is gonna just delete files in the disk folder using the then uh, module. Uh, but what I think is a uh, good advancement for GUP is that it it allows to it allows to reduce modules. For instance, I got this file in JS. If you look carefully, there's no dependency on GUP at all. So let's say tomorrow you want to ditch GUP and use something else. This is just not JS. You can use this file. Uh, Without having to rely on GUP. And that's a good point, which will introduce our third and last part. It's going to be quick, I promise. Uh, which talk about uh, NPM scripts and. Yes, okay. But let's start with NPM scripts. Should we start using those tools? How to use NPM script and are there the solution? Uh, this is a legitimate question. Because for me, a lot of plugins are just wrappers around something, some tools that we could easily call uh, uh, on, on the terminal. And another problem is that you have to rely on a global dependency, which is the key specific to each test runner. So if you want something self-contained uh, to avoid problems, that's maybe not a good solution. And yeah, most. Most tasks can be achieved by using terminal commands, and that's just something that you should be using the terminal. Uh, if you doubt about that, just have a look at Simon's uh, .dot file on GitHub. And you see that there's a lot of stuff very really interesting that can speed up your workflow. And so, how do you use uh, npm scripts? We got a package JSON file. Uh, basically, you got the script uh, key index, and which contain other keys, and uh, which define uh, commands. Uh, and if you want to run them, you run npm run the name of the script. So, for instance, if I run npm run dev, it's going to run this model in parallel. Those three other uh, scripts, if you want to look at them, uh, the scripts. Dev scripts is just a browser file which takes a file, transform them uh, using a transform uh, ESC file and transform them into uh, S5 uh, and put them into a destination folder. Uh, same story for the style, we're using Stylus. Uh, we're watching our source folder each time I change my style. This puts the file into uh, a destination folder. And this reload automatically, this live reload my processing setup, which listens to the disk folder. You got a complete, simple workflow here. So, why should we, should we be using uh, all of this environment of Gulp? Yeah, there are a lot of pros. It's fast to configure it if you know how to use it. There's, uh, it's fast to build. Uh, all the config is in one place, so no more uh, search for this particular task, uh, which I didn't see, and there's no extra global dependency. But one of the biggest problems is the readability of the commands, which can be tackled otherwise. And the compatibility between Linux and Windows system, because some command doesn't work the same on Windows than they work on the 
un unique system with six, etc. So I'd say it's a solution, not the solution. It's a good solution if you want to build quick prototypes. Uh, maybe if you're working on teams with different developers, different uh, configuration, uh, it's probably best to stick with GUG or Grunt uh, and Task Runner. All right, last part, 2016. Uh, what is this thing called JavaScript by again? What is my prescription? Uh, last year, we seen a huge amount of new tools emerging. Uh, this is not really correct. Uh, this is a tweet from Adias Mani, which said that 2015, JavaScript tool X was useful. Uh, 2016, make it easier, and start set up, etc. Because I really think you, as developers, should be spending more time developing cool stuff than configuring your workflow. Uh, got some articles here to, uh, to read, make yourself an opinion. And for me, it's not a problem that there are so many tools emerging. It's great that the web is so active. And this is another quote, but it's great. Just because it's there doesn't mean you must learn it and use it. It's not because React is so uh, so famous now that you have to learn it. You need to use it. Um, it needs to fit your your UX, your user experience. The user should be uh, what uh, the user experience should be what uh, deciding which tool you are using. And my last piece of advice, uh, if you're working in a team, it's maybe good to pick style guides to, to work together and uh, that will let you become a better developer. Uh, you have to, yeah, that's a thing you should uh, be doing and stick with it. Uh, you should Pick the right scaffold. There are so many scaffolds out there already. Great, the Google Web Starter Kit, React Starter Kit. So try to find one that fits your needs. And if not the closest, then find a way to adapt it. And finally, stick with it. Because uh, I don't know for you guys, but last year I've been using the same workflow only twice. And this is not right. It's not right. That doesn't mean you don't have to. To stay curious, you should be uh, aware of new tools, but don't spend too much time, don't lose too much time. And because, yeah, you have to stay curious, because as developer, that's uh, a really good thing to just discover new stuff, new tools to play with. And that would be my final word. Thank you, guys. <laughs>